Hello, 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 and welcome or welcome back. I am so freaking excited to be back and talking to you guys. You saw the title. We are continuing our analysis of Taylor Swift's The Tortured Poets Department, the anthology. We got all the way through the albatross in the last one. Yes, that's not very far, but listen, the, these songs are dense, okay? I could count on one hand. It wouldn't even take up a whole hand, the songs that are like not dense. They're just kind of like, what they are. So if you have not seen any of these videos, we went all the way through the standard version. I have parts one and part two of that up as well as part one of analyzing the anthology songs. We just go through them and analyze the lyrics as if they were poetry and find how that writing and her word choice and all of the things that you would analyze and annotate poetry for, we go through and we talk about it and how that holds hands with the context of the song and its place in the album and its place in the Taylor Swift cinematic universe and how it holds hands with the production and how that affects things and just kind of going through and picking it all apart line by line. I bought like glitter gel pens to do this for the first ones but then those ran out and they're all dead now so we're using pen and pencil and eraser and that's just all fine. A quick disclaimer as we always must, these are art. Um, this is art by an artist that I absolutely love and so I am analyzing it as a piece of art by someone I like through my lens and my experience as a Swifty and just like my own context as a person who listens to her songs. The great thing about her songs and all art is that they can have so many different facets and interpretation and different ways that they can be looked at. Each piece of art is a mirror ball if you will and and so please not take anything that I say as like hard fact or something that I'm trying to like fight for as the truth or something that is personal um, to you or about your favorite song or Taylor because that is simply not the intention. We are just fan girlies Swifty talking about our favorite artists work because we love to. But without further ado, let's get into Chloe or Sam or Sophia or Marcus. A very, listen, people have opinions about this song. You have thoughts on this song because she's hard to ignore. So this song starts right away. There's essentially no intro and it is this beautiful piano. And there is, I made a TikTok about it the first time I realized it. It was in like the first couple days of this album coming out. And this song, it was one of those that, it was like Dear Reader. It had a pull to me. It was quiet and it quietly whispered, come back, spend some more time with me. I think we could be close. And it was right. And I realized that the part of, I am very medium on champagne problems. Champagne problems, it'll, it'll connect back, I promise. Just stay with me. Champagne problems is the type of song that I would have absolutely fallen hard for in like high school, middle school. It is my brand of Taylor Swift song when I was like, growing up as a Swifty and my tastes have kind of just like changed and evolved with me as I'm sure Taylor's have. But Champagne Problems is a very classic Taylor Swift song in that way and I'm very medium on it except for there's this one part at the end that she doesn't do when she plays it live but it is on the recording of this song and she does this trill on the piano that just goes it's like up and down and then up and down and it just makes me think of the champagne bubbles going up and down and like moving up and down in the glass and that's because that's what's on the lyric video and so that's the image I have connected with it but I just think it's so pretty and that's all you hear and it's just this simple little piano thing that is like part of the backing I don't know if it's the exact same notes but it's something very similar this like tumbles up then it tumbles back down um, and it's very soft um, and it just kind of repeats throughout the whole of this. This is kind of just like this continuous almost like beat poetry song and that piano just kind of like keeps cycling in the back and it almost feels like it's like moving through the cycle of them and the wondering and like I don't know it just kind of connects with the rumination of this song to me very well the tumbling up and the tumbling down of it. it kind of like toils and tumbles on itself but like doesn't resolve um similarly to their relationship this definitely feels like a complete poem a complete song i don't feel like i'm left wondering um for anything and it doesn't really repeat itself either it is just one linear 
piece um, from beginning to end. Your hologram stumbled into my apartment. This man is always being referred to as a ghost, a phantom, an apparition of a being. This man is rarely like present. Um, it's always like your ghost, your something. Like I feel like the memories and thoughts that she has of like this relationship are being in person are so specific and so powerful and then she has to deal with like his hologram his memory his ghost so 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 much um in the interim um between their kind of collisions and then after of course he stumbled which could either be like intoxication or like a makeout session why and also why is he stumbling into her apartment is it because this song is her ruminating like your hologram stumbled into my apartment like this is her memory i believe that's what this is this is like something she's going through in her head kind of like a dream or like something that she's like thinking through so this slightly drunken man chaotically stumbling in to her life her apartment him tumbling into her psyche deep in a makeout session hands in the hair super into somebody it doesn't really matter who could be anyone or everyone in darkness so again like you can't see who the person is this is a very vague um like hidden thing from her um and like it might even be vague and hidden to him like it's not even like that deep or that serious it's just like the somebody anybody of it all is very emphasized in this um but also like in darkness gives you the setting nighttime named chloe or sam or sophia or marcus so i feel like people have gripes with this being the title of the song and i get it but i feel like that line emphasizes the constant anyone and everyone of it all doing this and that and the other thing with this and that and the other person because that is just kind of the tornado that he is and she just watched it happen it implies that something else should have happened um this phrase is so so powerful and i love how it's used over and over in this song and the way it's said with such kind of a little bit desperation um and sadness in it every single time and even like maybe some flashes of like anger when she's talking about him because she does say it about both of them and the balance of that i think creates kind of a sense of equal responsibility but the context in which she says it and how she says it i think delivers um the emotion behind the responsibility so then we turn the page i feel like there should be a then um before as but there's not it's as the decade would play us for fools and you saw my bones out with somebody new so now we know we are back when they first met in the 1989 era about a decade ago give or take and you saw my bones out with somebody new he was watching her out with somebody new whether that be calvin whether that be joe the word bones is also very um haunting it gives kind of a skeleton of the person that you used to know vibe you just kind of see the idea or the memory of them walking around but someone's bones is also that's just also very deep and like personal and internal um to someone to know someone's bones or see them is just there's a haunting aching um ness to that but also she could be referring to the fact that she was particularly thin in this era and she's talked about her struggle with that i don't want to harp on that but that could be a reference somebody new who seemed like he would have bullied you in school this really makes me think um that it was calvin because they were kind of like at parties and stuff in the same orbit um right around when she did start dating calvin and so it seems kind of like it could have been maddie maybe at that time but it ended up being calvin and so he had to watch the memory of her of what could have been out with somebody who looked like he would have bullied him in school which is also a very specific type of hurt and a very specific type of anger if you've ever been like the bullied um i feel like you can understand that statement and that feeling and i can definitely see maddie taking on that role as well and you just watched it happen and so she says i just watched it happen and then she flips it around and says and you know what you just watched it happen too we both contributed to the breakdown of this if you want to break my cold cold heart 
I feel like she is, so she's talking to him here. And when she says my cold, cold heart, it sounds like she's being facetious. She's being sarcastic and saying that like her heart isn't cold, but someone has clearly told her that it's super cold um, enough for her to like say it twice. That's kind of where like the sarcasm comes in. And so I have to wonder if that's coming from people saying that she was like a cyborg hungry for attention or was it him? Um, because that pisses me off because based on everything else that's been said in a lot of these other songs, he's the one that sounds like he has a cold, cold heart. But anyway, just say I loved you the way that you were. So if you want to break my heart, just say that I loved you the way you were before the decade had played us for fools. Because that would mean that if they'd just taken a different turn, then things might have been different. And that thought is absolutely devastating that you were like one like sliding doors moment away from going on a completely different path. If you want to tear my world apart, just say you've always wondered. Again, that would tear her world apart because it's too late to go back and change it now. And she has always wondered too. That's kind of like the implication. And like, if you want to say, if you want to break me down, say you loved me then and you've always wondered because the implication is because I did too and I do too. And how fucking tragic is it that that connection just never happened, um, that we were both thinking the same thing going in opposite directions, um, which kind of comes into my thoughts about another song that I really like, but we'll get there. One of my favorite lines and another uh, popular favorite line for other people is you said some things that I can't unabsorb. And I love that because there are some ideas and some things that people like put in your head and some things that affect you that like, you're like, I can't unhear that. Like I can't, but she says, I can't unabsorb. Like they've been fully like absorbed into her. They can't be ripped or taken out. They need to be exercised like a demon. And it's like the way that she says it, it's like sad, but it's like those things might have been good. I might have liked them, but you turned me into an idea of sorts. That's not a good thing, which is like an idea, like is kind of like both more and less than a person. It's this like big higher thing, but it's also not concrete. It's not something you want your partner to think of you as. You want your partner to see you as you and you want them to see you as a human. You needed me, but you needed drugs more and I couldn't watch it happen. And it feels like that line kind of says why they didn't end up together. They needed each other but he needed drugs more and she chose to not watch that happen. And that's how they separated. They both chose at that point and those led them in different directions. And she ended up linking up with Calvin and then Joe. She changed into goddesses, villains and fools, highs, lows and betrayals, changed plans and lovers, lover and outfits, different eras and rules, different album releases, different relationships, all to outrun my desertion of you. Now, I think that's a little hyperbolic. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but perhaps that was something that was always kind of in the back of her mind. Kind of like how, I don't know, we all have like our our little wonders um, and our little regrets. And even if you are happy with where your life is now, there are small things that you know you could have done in different turns and different sliding doors moments that you could have taken that you might always have just kind of back there. And there might be some things that you push a little harder and that you do a little bit more because you need to prove to yourself that you made the right choice. Um, and so I think that's what she's talking about here. It's something that was in the back of your mind and you can really see it in the one. She's saying like, I have no defense for bringing this up again. Um, it's just kind of, it's kind of there. Um, and it is what it is kind of. Um, and I think that's why so many people relate to that song is because we do relate to the idea of like, I'm not saying that like, I'm going to come rushing back to this because that kind of doesn't exist anymore. But wouldn't it have been cool? I do just kind of still think about it. Sorry. Sorry if you don't. I just, it's, mm, my brain's just kind of hanging on to that because it was so bright um, and so sweet and so different. And you just watched it. 
And there's some definite anger in that. And it's not, you just watched it happen. It's, and you just watched it. And she definitely went through some shit um, between when her and Maddie kind of came close to each other in their orbit before and when they separated and then kind of came closer together again, at least um, to the public knowledge. She definitely went through some bad things. Her fall from the 1989 era and then into the reputation era and then kind of like feeling insecure on Lover and thinking that was kind of like her last push and then writing folklore in like a depression in the pandemic um, and the success of that, but like the definite sadness behind it as well as Evermore. She went through a lot um, and he definitely knew more than like we all did and he just watched it and that probably really fucking hurt. And then we get another one of our kind of like little chorus, I guess, of coming back to the thought in this kind of like rumination of the timeline of them saying like, if you want to tear my world apart, if you want to take the fabric of the narrative that I see as my life and make me experience the horror of feeling like I've made a grave error and wasted a ton of time, say that you loved me then and that you've just been wondering this whole time like I had. Um, because, oh my God, what if the question that I have deep in my eyes, followed the ache in your sigh back to the origin of us both, down that passage in time, back through the decade that played us for fools. If both of our wondering went back in time to the moment that I crashed into you, like in guilty as sin, crashing in to him tonight, like so many wrecks do, saying that they were both already a wreck when they met, um, that also sounds like very fatal. Too impaired by my youth to know what to do. So if the question in my eyes followed the ache in your sigh back through the decade that had played us for fools, back to the moment that we collided, both a mess in our own ways, then would everything be different if one thing had been different? And that's the question, friends. That is the question. And people, when people ask why I'm so into Taylor Swift, like it goes, it's a very personal thing. It's a very like growing up with her thing, but it's also this shit. Not to mention like just that verse is so beautifully written and so specific, but then if you pull apart each line, it sounds so good. If the glint in my eye traced the depths of your sigh down that passage in time, how it affects me, how it affects you, and we both went back and looked at it together, would we see that if we had done different things, things would have ended up differently? But I was too young and naive to know how to handle it better um, for my part. She kind of gives um, him a reason for his part. The, you needed me, but you needed drugs more and you just watched it happen. But she's kind of giving that reason for her just watching it happen, being too impaired by her youth to know what to do. And so she, instead, she just watched it happen. So if I sell my apartment, her apartment is really, really attached to the memory of him. She talks about it in the Tortured Poets Department and she talks about it in The Black Dog. And so her version of letting go and moving on and being very like clean and entirely like done um, is very practical. Like she likes to like wipe everything um, away and just be like, I'm not surrounded by these memories anymore. Goodbye. And you have some kids with an internet starlet. So her version of moving on and his version of moving on. Very celebrity, very different. Hers is very clean, entire, and practical. Will that make your memory fade from this scarlet maroon? That's the color of his memory. Interesting. Also, she finally told us who oh, that fucking song was about. Oh my God. And also the rust that grew between telephones totally makes sense now. As the decade was playing them for fools, the rust that grew between telephones. It's, and she just keeps playing that song on tour, man. She just keeps playing it. Um, and I have to wonder why. Um, it's just, like, I like that song. I'm so curious to know why 
she likes that song so much. I wonder if it's cathartic for her or if it's just that she knows the fans really, really like it or if there's something in there that is specifically painful um, for Maddie. I don't know. I kind of hope so, but like it never happened. Oh God, isn't that what you want when you've been like scarred by this, by something like this? Could it be enough? Could it be fine? I feel like to just float in your orbit. Fine is the word that is connected to that line for me. Because it's not like she's saying, could I be thrilled and happy? It's like, could I be fine to just kind of be in your orbit? And we're not together. We're just kind of acquaintances, neighbors, if you will. Can we watch our phantoms dancing on the terrace, their memory? Can we hold that like watching wild horses? Something that is interesting and great and beautiful from a distance, but really dangerous and hard to control and not something you want to be in the thick of. Cooler in theory, but not if you force it. And then she says to be. So something that is cool in theory and from a distance and the idea seems to make sense, but if you try and force it to be that idea, or you just force it to be, you force it to exist um, when it doesn't, it just didn't happen. They tried to force it to be, and it just wasn't. The thing that was cool in theory did not translate into reality. Um, also, wild horses are something that is kind of untamable, uncatchable, and fickle, and runs away. You can't really capture that. And so I feel like this really gives a clear picture of like the breakdown and the idea both or just her had in her head for Guilty of Sin and Fresh Out the Slammer. And then when they tried to make it happen, it just didn't. And like, that's kind of the long and short of it. It just didn't. So if you want to break my cold, cold heart, say that you loved me this time. And if you want to tear my world apart, say you'll always wonder if this time we could have done anything, if anything, if there was any way that this could have slid into place and been as perfect as we thought it would be. Because I wonder now, will I always, will I always wonder? And that's kind of the thesis of the song, sort of. Will I always wonder about this? This song is the esoteric cousin. Now the esoteric sibling of the one. The one is kind of cool and popular. This one's very heady and very nerdy and like just like too smart to be popular. Um, but like is a really, really good writer. We're keeping it under two hours, people. We're keeping it under two hours. We move swiftly on to how did it end? This song sounds like a funeral processional and that's because it is. We hereby conduct this post-mortem. This is a group, this is a formal group presentation. This is a clinical procedural thing. He was a hothouse flower to my outdoorsman. So it feels like there's a colon after that first line. We hereby conduct this post-mortem. This is a formal group affair and it is clinical, it is procedural. This is what the postmortem has to say. He was a hothouse flower, something sensitive and wilting, something pretty that must be kept warm indoors to my outdoorsman, something adventurous, sturdy, wandering, curious, and hungry. Our maladies, um, medical flaws, also sounds like melodies. Um, I thought it was melodies when I first heard it, which um, is something that's like, very much someone's like inherent um, an essence, um, which also, if you want to talk about like her and Maddie, like both being musicians, um, our melodies were such that we could not cure them. Um, we're not going to really talk about who this song is about um, because I don't really think that's specifically like relevant to it. I think this song is more just kind of about an idea in the same way who's afraid of little old me is. Um, but either way, it is maladies because that is a medical term. Um, mal as in the Latin root that means bad. Um, our maladies, like our flaws, the things that were wrong with us were such we could not cure them like an illness, but also like the idea to like cure something, like to put something to fuse it together um, to process and combine it. It just, it wouldn't happen. And so a touch that was my birthright became foreign um and that's like super separate from the metaphor that they had 
that we were doing before. Um, it's not like the clinical formal medical thing we were doing. And so it, it kind of confuses me a little bit. And so like, it's moments like that where I understand people who don't like this song or people saying that the song is a little bit overwrought or overwritten. And then we jump into the chorus. Come one, come all, it's happening again. Um, this is a regular show, a spectacular even, a repeated occurrence, whether it be good or bad. The idea of empathetic hunger, we are starving for all of the information so that we can hurt and feel more close to her and this person who we like have this very like almost obsessive but like very close parasocial relationship with due to the emotional and personal nature of her song the hunger descends sounds very vulturous um like something large and looming coming down to pick apart the bones of something dying and suffering we'll tell no one except all of our friends we are your friends and to be trusted, we'll tell no one, but we'll also do nothing but talk about you all the time because that's kind of how the parasocial relationship works. And it's kind of not fair on that on that side of it. I mean, we're getting her vulnerability and entertainment and content and we're saying like, we're here for you, we support you and she's getting that back from us. But then we're also constantly gossip and talk about her all the time because of her status as a celebrity. We must no, it's like we almost feel like we have a right to know. It's urgent. It is not a want. It is a need. We must know. We need definite proof. It needs to be a no, not a speculation. How did it end? Tell us what happened. Walk us through it. We want specifics and we are searching for them in the song lyrics. We are searching for them in the press releases. We want the breakdown. We want the P. We want the plot for the reality show that we are watching that is this woman's life. We were blind to unforeseen circumstances. We learned the right steps to different dances, which is, so that's very PR. Um, it could also be true, but it's, it's very PR. Um, they both tried, but just not in the right ways. We couldn't have controlled it. Um, this whole blurb is kind of what you condense down to for the masses, the cliche phrases that you give, the condensed down the haze and mess and breakdown of a relationship that is not so clean cut that sometimes you're not even sure what happened. These are the things that you say. We fell victim to interlopers glances. The publicity was simply too much. We lost the game of chance. What are the chances? That's again, kind of like facetious and ironic because like losing the game of chance when things are left to chance is pretty likely. She kind of switches. I really like all the metaphors and framing she does in this song, but she switches between them and it's sometimes not always clear on first listen when she's switching, but then once you realize it, it kind of all comes together. This is like another like fantasy that the celebrity on the side of this parasocial relationship would be thinking about all of her fans doing. Soon they'll go home to their husbands, smug because they know they can trust him. All these people who support and relate to her and are, you know, getting entertainment and content from her heartbreaks and saying they understand are going home to men that they do still have smug because they know that they can trust him. They'll go home and comfort to laugh at her pain and then feverishly calling their cousins, gossiping with the community and the people that they do have, their family, the partners that they do still have, talking about the one that she doesn't anymore and the breakdown of her life. I guess who we ran into at the shops walking in circles like she was lost. Not necessarily like what they would say about a celebrity, but the idea of someone's relationship breaking down and then the town um, or the town, if you want to be very Bridgerton about it, talking about, oh, the poor thing. She's wandering. She has no idea what she's doing anymore. I heard this. I heard that. Did you know? Oh my goodness. I feel so bad. But actually, like, do you know what happened? Please give me the information because obviously it's so terribly awful, but like, 
I need the full story. I need the tea. Didn't you hear? They called it all off. One gasp, one moment of feigned empathy before asking what they really want to know. How did it end? And then we cut off from kind of that thought bubble and go into the deep cutting, heart-wrenching bridge. Say it once again with feeling. Really, please force yourself to relive your feelings and really like show us the pain for us. Go into detail about the worst moments because that's really what we're interested in. We're really deeply interested in the depths of your pain. How the death rattle breathing, oh, silence, like the very last moments. Tell us just the worst, get, really get into the twisting of the knife here. Silenced as the soul was leaving, the deflation of our dreaming, leaving me bereft and reeling. So she's talking about like kind of being asked to become extremely like masturbatory about her pain for the benefit of a larger audience and perhaps for even content. Leaving me bereft, desolate and reeling, spinning my beloved ghost in me. The idea of what was and all that she had sitting in a tree alone, feeling like she's dying. And the way she takes the like sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G, she turns this little love song into something so sad. It's like the little love song has gone wrong and now it's a breakup song. It's so sad. I absolutely love that. And now this last little kind of mini chorus at the end of the bridge when she says it's happening again, it feels like you hear this is her sitting crying in the tree. It's happening again. How did it end? I can't pretend like I understand how did it end. And so that's, again, something that hurts so much is she doesn't actually know how it ends. She can't pretend she actually understands what happened. And so she's asking herself and sitting there devastated, feeling like she's D-Y-I-N-G, saying it's happening again. How is it happening again? How did it end? I just don't understand. And then we zoom back out to wrap everything up with come one, come all. It's happening again, but I still don't know how did it end. And reiterating um, and kind of like coming to a conclusion with, you all want to know this and you all kind of like descend with fervor with this question, but honestly, I don't have the details for you. I don't know. Um, I can give you my feelings and my pain and just really relive it and get deep into it and hurt myself even more um, for you. But I don't have more than that because it wasn't that clean cut and relationships rarely are. And so for that, I really appreciate and like the depth and importance of this song. And I think different nature of it um, sort of drives people away from it. I feel like this is maybe an exaggeration because people really have a problem with the song Happiness. And the thing is, is I think Happiness, when I first heard that song, that song hit me like a truck because I really needed to be walked through a breakup in that way and be like, that could be real and you can be absolutely devastated and at rock bottom now, and you will be anew again. You will find happiness again. You absolutely will. That song really, really affected me lyrically, but it was just kind of not much to listen to in my opinion. And I feel like a lot of other people feel that way too. It's also very long. Um, and so to a lesser extent, I feel like that's a little bit how this song is. But anyway, we move on to so high school, which I did actually record yesterday. So let's go to yesterday Tay for So High School. Now, I like this song. Despite all the songs that I'd like to hear her sing live, this is not the biggest wish of mine. You'll be happy to know that as of editing this, I have actually, well, not entirely changed my mind. Of course, I would still love to hear Guilty as Sin, but honestly, watching her perform this every show and like, especially the ones that like Travis or his family's been there, it's just made my heart so happy. It's been so great. And you can tell she loves doing it. Um, It makes me happy. And I love that she sang the whole thing as a surprise song, like for him um, when like the fam was there. So yeah, Um, have I been Tavis pilled? Mayhaps? I don't know. I feel like being Tavis pilled is like being like their end game and like 
I don't know, like, I'm here for the girly. Um, and so if she wants them to be endgame, then that is her decision to make whenever she wants to make. Um, but like, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying, I'm smiling, I'm clapping, I'm hand hurting. But this song very much fits the vibe that has been presented as Tavis, as the Tay Trab relationship thus far. Not only like the newness and the butterflies and like the euphoric feelings, those are like definitely described here, but also the feeling of having a crush and, and flirting and texting them and meeting their friends and going to games and practice and cheering for them and maybe sneaking around a little bit. And it's, it's just, it's horny, silly, happy, floaty, times and this song is profoundly like a high school relationship in the vibe of it you know it's it's intoxicating and a little bit playful i'm a little bit nervous in a happy way and like not that serious but like in in a good way she does not say love um, which is which is interesting. Um, the way that she sings is also it's just very floaty and falsetto and the way that she has the rhymes she just has very like playful rhymes in this song and it creates kind of like a bounciness. When I think of this song I think of football games um, and like the few positive memories I have of them and like pink bubbles. I feel so high school every time I look at you and there's something about being high in this song just the euphoria of like high on love you know like the new relationship chemicals being high on each other and so there's something about the if you took out the word school i feel so high every time i look at you kind of feels like what this song is about but then there's also like i feel so high school like because that is kind of also the feeling and then he's a football player and she's like kind of like his cheerleader and also like the chosen cheerleader for all of America. There's something in high school about the adolescent infatuation with inebriation that really kind of locks in with the inebriation being high on love and each other when you are really happy with someone and really into someone and like all of the chemicals are chemicaling. <laughs> I want to find you in a crowd just to hide from you. Maybe this is just the girlies, but the girlies understand. Like it's it's weird, like the idea of someone coming up behind you and hugging you, very cute, very romantic, very fun. The idea of like watching someone um, that you like from afar and like watching them like look for you and just like feeling like and knowing they're looking for you and just being all excited and happy about it. Maybe this is toxic, I don't know. Um, but these things just sound very exciting, fun and playful. And I, I don't know, I get it. It's for the girls, what can I say? It's, it's very cute. In the blink of a crinkling eye, I'm sinking our fingers intertwined, them falling for each other and like sinking into that and then like also coming together and like becoming intertwined. Um, our cheeks pink in the twinkling lights. These are very cute words. Our cheeks pink in the twinkling lights. Pink is very much like a color I associate with this song, but also like not sparkling lights. These lights are twinkling and like the football lights, but also they could be the concert lights too. I just wrote romance with little twinkles um and hearts next to it for these two lines and this is partially what i'm talking about with the fun little rhyme schemes in the blink of a crinkling eye i'm sinking our fingers intertwine and then it's i'll drink what you think and i'm high from smoking your jokes all damn night like it's just cute they're bouncy and fun it reminds me of um I don't know, the kind of fun, happy giddiness of paper rings and I think he knows, but this is different and I like it and there's not really any anxiety to it. Tell me about the first time you saw me. I think this is really cute. The idea of talking to someone that you are now with and hearing like, I don't know, their first thoughts and their first impression and how they like went about getting into your relationship. I don't know. And like you doing the same for them. It's just, it's fun and it's cute and it's very high school. And I'm sure for them as like, I don't know, well-known people, especially Taylor Swift, I'm sure it's very interesting and fun to hear about like so. What'd you think? Like before you met me, like what were you, what were you thinking about the tunes? Um, what'd you think about the albums? Were you listening? Do you have any memories? Any songs? Like, I don't know. I just think that'd be fun. Um, and cute. I'm sure that's not what she means, but I think that would be fun and cute. I'll drink what you think and I'm high again, just being high on each other and like the idea of like, 
again, like adolescent inebriation <laughs> from smoking your jokes all damn night. That's all she needs is his jokes to feel high. On the Brink of a Wrinkle in Time. That's a book and or a movie, I believe. Bittersweet 16, Suddenly. I'm watching American Pie with you on a Saturday night. Why is the 16 bittersweet? Um, is it because they've met each other, it took them this long to meet each other, or because they can't see each other as constantly because she's touring when they met? Um, what, why? Why is it bittersweet, I ask? Suddenly, she's watching American Pie with you on a Saturday night. Very normal couple memory. Very early 2000s Americana movie. I picture them on a couch. Your friends are around, so be quiet. I'm trying to stifle my size. Very high school in that, like, you only have so many places <laughs> to, like, hook up and do things. And so maybe you take the opportunity to do that when you're like hanging out at a friend's place and you like go into like the bedroom or whatever but like they're still and so you can't like make noise or whatever um i'm trying to stifle my size so like very sexy but also like very high school because i feel so high school every time i look at you but look at you um which is again like well a little bit of sexiness you know but like high school is like horny like that's definitely a part of feeling like so high school is being like so horny for each other <laughs> are you gonna marry forever kiss temporary or kill me destroy and devastation me it's just a game it's not that serious but really um that's also so high school like oh it's just a game but like actually um but also like football is a game i'm betting on all three and you bet on games you bet on football um I'm betting on all three of those, on the whole package, all of it, for us too. Um, there's also something playful about like, I'm betting on all three for us too. Playful. Get my car door, isn't that sweet? A gentleman, I picture someone like taking a girl out on a first date. Um, he, oh god, he opens up my door and I get into his car and he says, you look beautiful tonight and I feel perfectly fine. But instead of that, this guy, pulls her to the back seat she has the fun times and the gentleman opening up her car door also um being pulled to the back seat and doing things in the back seat of a car also very very high school no one's ever had me not like you and so then we have the like being pulled to the back seat of a car no one's ever had me and so there's like this weird implication of like this like the, the loss of a virginity as like a teenager in high school in the backseat of a car and that's a very like high school image but it says not like you and so it's like no one's ever had me like has me in a relationship like you've got me babe um no one's ever had me like you do but then that also could be implied as sexual because it's like right after the last line she's very good at being like very sneakily sexual in this song but also really really fits because again like i said being so high school is also being so horny um <laughs> say it again for the ones in the back because i i really do think that's true um and that's very much a part of this song that taylor swift is like not being hesitant about because also again truth dare spin bottles those are horny ass games that teenagers play because they're horny ass teenagers you know how to ball i know aristotle um again that's just so silly and funny how very travis Brand new, full throttle, always loving the car metaphor, Taylor, always loving the love is a car from Taylor we had in But Daddy I Love Him, um, hand on the throttle, thought I caught lightning in a bottle from Prophecy, love it. We are going full speed here, touch me while your bros play Grand Theft Auto, your friends are around so be quiet. I, I don't feel like that's something that they have to do, I feel like it's fun for them though, and maybe, maybe they do, maybe they only get to see each other in certain circumstances when it works out, and so they do end up touching each other while the bros are playing grand theft auto i don't know i that line really is i'm i find it funny and referential and like clever i get it and i'm sure she does too i have a disdain for grand theft auto and people who play it religiously and so it's just a really big turn off if you're really into grand theft auto <laughs> to me and so the fact that it's in this song it's just it's so the idea of like if someone wanted to hook up while their friends were playing grand theft auto the only reason that would be acceptable was if they were just like 
not quite as much into the game, but then that, that's still your bros. I don't know. It's, uh, it just gets weird and messy for me. And like, that's my own problem. I don't really want to hear about it. So like, my question is, when did this happen? Cause this is, this was a choice. Um, but then also the line after it is, it's true swear scouts honor. Um, which again is like the thing that you, say when you're like a kid and you're like it's true swear scouts honor like you're trying to be like no I heard it no like it's true like and you're trying to like convince someone of something and so like I don't know it's true swear scouts honor she could be saying that about the touching me while your girls playing while your bros are playing Grand Theft Auto line or she could be just be saying like how I feel how I feel so high school it's true I swear scouts honor you know what you wanted and boy you got her he was talking the talk and he began walking the walk he shot his shot and you know what he got it brand new full throttle you already know babe um very cute and like i don't know just a very chill taylor lyric but also very different than i think he knows there is no hesitance and no uncertainty in you already know babe it's just i don't know it's comfortable and happy and chill and i I love that for her and it seems sincere. I feel like laughing in the middle of practice. Maybe it's her practice, um, just out of giddiness, um, but probably um, the ball practice. I drew a little football next to it. Do that impression you did of your dad again. I'm hearing voices like a madman, kind of like the hallucinations she was talking about in Guilty as Sin, but now it's hearing voices of him doing impressions of his dad and laughing during practice because she is so happy and he's being a goof and making her laugh um and just like feeling in love and we repeat and she says you already know babe you already know babe to wrap it up um and the more i listen to the song the more it's growing on me it has a very summery sunny vibe um and so i've been listening to it a lot more lately it's lovey and happy and unapologetic about that in the way that stay 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 and paper rings are but in like a little bit of a less cringy way well it's cringy in its own way it's cringy in an updated way <laughs> how about that and like just thinking about the progression from like you belong with me to this just makes my little swifty heart like I'm picturing like a little heart with like the fearless stress tassels on it and it's just like swinging the tassels faster 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 oh god I hate it here now if I had seen this title you know how we had like the song titles prior to the release of Tortured Poets Department for like the standard edition but we didn't like know about the anthology and like the uh, second side if I had seen I hate it here I would have been like oh my god millennial taylor there are just so many like dry humor responses to things that like especially millennials just kind of say in response to anything and everything even when it doesn't make sense same is one of them and i hate it here is another this is fine is another like the dog that's sitting in like the burning room so it's funny because this song does definitely encompass the like I hate it here and by here I mean this job and by here I mean America and by here I mean earth and by here I mean life it does like encompass like kind of that but it also like takes it into like the deeper emotional feelings and circumstances behind that for not just everybody but like her specifically and so there are some universal statements and then there are some statements that are specific to just her um, and the production of this very much sounds like it's like the the fantasy and wonder and like kind of folklore vibes of like going into a secret garden or a lunar valley but kind of the melancholy and the sadness and like the ever more vibes of like going there to escape and it being fake and like not necessarily i always picture like being in the lunar valley in her mind it's so sweet and it's so wonderful but then she reaches out to like touch the wall um of like the lunar canyon or whatever and it like all disappears um and she's back in the gray walls under the blue ceilings that are painted the color of Joe's freaking mood. So we start off um, with a line that is very specific to her. Quick, quick, tell me something awful. Quick, quick, do this, do this, um, save me. It's just this very classic, like, urgent damsel in distress. Quick, quick, please. Um, but then it's quick, quick, tell me something awful. And you're like, what? Um, like you are a poet trapped inside the body of a finance guy. So then you're like, oh, 
tell me something with some semblance of depth, some semblance of feeling. I would love to feel something even if it is awful, like you were someone deep and emotional and complex, trapped inside this outer exterior of someone bland and cold that I'm experiencing and seeing. Tell me all of your secrets. Give me something real and human to grab onto and to love and to connect with. Because as it is now, all he will ever be is my eternal, permanent, something I am stuck with, consolation prize, something that I didn't actually win, but I got this instead. Um, yikes. Ouch. That's a big ouch. She uses so much like imaginative, ethereal, take me away to Neverland language. I think eternal and the quick, quick drama um, is a really good like start to that. Um, also using a poet, not even someone that's like super smart um, or famous or whatever or special, but someone who dedicates their time to looking at the intricacies of emotion and appreciating things, documenting the way the light moves and the way love functions. She's begging for connection. She's begging to experience an emotion that's not blue or gray. Tell me all of your secrets. Give me something more because I feel like, have you ever met someone that you just feel like, you're like, there's gotta be more. There has to be more here, but you just feel like you're hitting an internal wall within them and you're like, you have nothing else going on. Um, I feel like this was her, but she was stuck in quarantine in dark stormy England with that person. Also the idea of it being like a poet and a finance guy, like a finance guy, like a fi finance bro, that's something that's like a very stereotypical like persona of today, but because like it's popular and lucrative and like very much follows the values that our system and our society right now rewards. And then like the complete flip side of that is a poet, someone who is valuing other things above money, valuing the exploration of human nature, valuing, you know, the things that um, I talked about being like the charge of a poet in the beginning. The That's something that is just like the soul of that is completely opposite to that of the finance guy. Um, and like the soul of our society seems very much to be finance guy -y, and the soul of the secret gardens in the lunar valleys seem to be very much that of a poet. You see, I was a debutante. A debutante is like a modern um, kind of like Southern version of think of Bridgerton when they're like coming out on the pawn or whatever. Um, and it's like their first year out or whatever. That's a debutante. Um, someone in very high society with a lot of money, someone very desired, someone young and shiny and new in another life. But now I seem to be scared to go outside. It's interesting. She says seem. It's interesting that she uses the word seem because it's either implying that she isn't actually scared to go outside and there's something else that's keeping her from going outside or she's like I seem to be scared to go outside like she's like surprised at herself because she was a debutante this isn't her she's behaving like a reclusive hot house flower who is terrified of going outside lest they catch a chill from the cold and be in a bad mood for the foreseeable. And now I feel like there should be like a but here, but if comfort is a construct, I don't believe in good luck now that I see what's what. I see reality now and it sucks. Nothing is real. Comfort is a construct. Good luck is not a real thing now that i see reality and how things actually are um i hate it and it sucks so i will go to secret gardens in my mind i will come up with fantasies and different worlds and narratives to attach myself to and entertain myself with people need a key to get to but the only one is mine none of the places that she talks about have people they're all just these escapes where she can be herself and swim in the things that bring her joy and not deal with the things that are happening in reality because reality is absolutely crushing um, and absolutely same. That is incredibly relatable. You know, that's not just a Taylor Swift thing. Um, you don't have to be stuck in a house in England with someone who you can't connect with anymore to feel that way. And so you keep these things, you know, under lock and key in your mind. You protect them from 
people because if you open up and they taint them with their memory, it's something you shared with them and then they go away, then that's something that isn't just yours anymore. That's not something that is an escape anymore um, or God forbid they judge them. And so you just keep people out of it. Um, it's just yours. I read about it in a book when I was a precocious child. Sometimes being a precocious child means not growing up at all. She read about this when she was a kid and she's still daydreaming about it now. So she's kind of saying in that way, like she's still using the daydreams of her childhood now. They're just more advanced. She was a precocious child and she still kind of is because precocious children sometimes don't always grow up. And in these fantasies that you have when you are a child, everything is big and bright. There are big city dreams and the monsters are huge and ginormous and life ending. But in real life, there are average hopes, no dreams at all, and small minded years um which sucks um and so she is in the secret gardens in her mind where the dreams are because she hates it here where there are small-minded fears and average sized hopes and no dreams and now we go back in to childhood and this song escapes back into childhood multiple times because that is when you were unaware of all of the things that make you hate it here now she's saying now that i know what's what comfort is a construct i don't believe in good luck all of these things that were kind of pieces of hope and things to hold on to in the world she is saying i've seen reality and i see that those things aren't real now, but when you were a kid, when you were playing games with your friends, when you were reading books when you were a child, you didn't realize all of those things. You still believed in good luck and miracles and comforts and things that were going to save you and work out and how fairy tales work is how life actually goes. And so she is escaping back into those really vivid images that she saw in her head as a child when she was in her imagination or reading or playing games with her friends. I don't know about you, but like I, the things that me and my friends did over and over and over again, or like my favorite books, I can still remember like generally like the pictures in my head and like what those looked like and why I liked them so much because your mind is so incredibly alive. Your imagination is so incredibly like vivid and alive when you are a kid. And so it makes it easier, at least in my experience, um, let me know if you agree. And it seems like in Taylor's experience too, to go back to that and retreat into that because it was so vivid and so real and there weren't necessarily as many things in reality to dash it and ruin it. And it was really fully flushed out and filled out because you were a kid and you just could do that so easily and you did constantly. And so it's kind of still there and it's still yours. Um, and especially if it's from childhood and like a book you read or like a game you played or something that you came up with, it doesn't really belong to anyone else. And so again, if you don't share it, no one can ruin it. And so you just kind of keep it to yourself. So my friends used to play a game where we would pick a decade we wished we could live in instead of this. Relatable. Kids, kids talk about that once you kind of start to get a little bit older and you understand like, oh, I want to live in a wild west. I want to be a cowboy. I want to be a flapper. You know, that um, generic type thing. I want to be a princess. Um, and so, of course, since Taylor is a reading precocious child, she says, I say the 1830s, but without all of the racists, people causing problems and getting married off for the highest bid, people selling someone to another person. Everyone would look down because it wasn't fun now, but it seems like it was never fun back then. Nostalgia is a mind trick. If I'd been there, I'd hate it. It was freezing in the palace. So in this verse, I know people have their own things to say about it, but she's saying, I remember when me and my friends were kids, we would play this game and I would say I would want to live in this decade with these vibes, but none of the bad stuff um, and like people ruining it. And all of her friends would look at her like, you're ruining this. Can we just pretend it was cute and perfect because right now sucks. And she says, well, my point is, I think then it would suck too. And the only place that doesn't suck is in a dream away from and above it, like at the lakes, um, which she has 
finally connected to this song in surprise songs which makes perfect sense because that was kind of like the prequel to this song and like so frequently the taylor we know would be like but we had all of these good things too then and we have all of these good things now and we had joy then the same as we do now and blah and like making a positive thing of it but she doesn't hear she's like no we're trying to escape back to then because now sucks but actually like then sucked too on um, people were continuing to suck things life was continuing to suck um and that's like kind of the reality and like that realization is really depressing and so it makes you say you know what i hate it here so i will go to lunar valleys in my mind this gives like a nighttime vibe to it it's not secret gardens it's lunar valleys it's giving like a dream thinking about when they found a better planet only the gentle survived so the people who would marry people off for the highest bid and people who were racist would not be there and so if we cleaned all of those people out maybe it would be fine i dreamed about it in the dark the night i felt like i might who made her feel like she might she constantly also talks about dreaming um with someone else in a pair but now she's dreaming alone and it is of escape and since then she has spent most of her time there so the night she felt she might was the night that she decided she knew what was what. She didn't believe in good luck. Comfort was a construct and things suck now. They always have sucked and that life is just maybe a little bit shitty. Um, and that made her feel like she might die among other things within the situation. And she dreamed about this lunar valley where only the gentle people survived. And she has since spent most of the year there because here sucks. And then she says outwards, yeah, I'm lonely, but I'm good. I'm bitter, but I swear I'm fine. Don't worry about me. I'm just going to disassociate because you genuinely would not understand. It would probably actually make me feel worse, um, that lack of understanding. And so I am just going to save it. I'm good. Don't worry. Um, and I'm just going to <laughs> back into my mind and disassociate. Um, I'm going to get lost out of here on purpose because this place made me feel worthless. Does she mean England? Does she mean society? Does she mean earth? Um, all of the above. Lucid dreams like electricity. This is giving very um, like the Lavender Haze music video vibes almost. The current flies through me and in my fantasies I rise above it and way up here I actually love it. So her dreams and her fantasies lift her up out of her depression and the chaos of the world to see a bigger, better picture however real or not real it might be. But when she is there and she can kind of connect to that, she actually does see hope and she actually does love it. Then we have another chorus. We wrap up with quick, quick, tell me something awful like you're a poet trapped inside of the body of a finance guy back to the first line, returning to reality again to beg for release and to beg for it to maybe be better um, because as much as you escape and as much as you say I hate it here so I will go, you still continue to try to shake reality back to maybe what it once was or what you once thought that it was because it is still reality and you still can't help but want to try and change it or fix it um, or do something. <laughs> this is a very apropos song for now. I feel like this song is a little bit buried and gets a little bit forgotten about, but I feel like this song is very relatable to now um, and people of all ages, but especially like people coming of age now. Um, and like, I don't know, like my age, give or take 10 years, you know, um, because it's rough out here. <laughs> This song is a sibling of mean. It is a sibling of this is why we can't have nice things. It is a sibling of vigilante shit. This is vengeful Taylor. Um, and yes, we're talking about the Kimye situation again. Um, it was really, it was, it was really fucked up. Um, it was, as she said, a frame job. The production of this song is very like happy and campy. And I think that's even added to more with the chorus the way it becomes very graphic in the chorus but then there's also like sparkles that come in which i i i enjoy um this song is not super duper metaphorical the metaphors are very shallow um and they're intentional and that's what makes it funny when she says i changed your name in any real defining clues because she didn't 
She didn't at all. This is a very straightforward hoop de doo fuck you of a song. <laughs> when I picture my hometown, so my past, my growing up, when I think back on my adolescence, if you will, maybe, there's a bronze spray tan statue of you. So when I picture where I'm from, the place that I go back to, maybe even LA, um, there's a bronze spray tan statue of you reminiscing how you threatened to push me down the stairs at our school. Um, so it's bronze. There are a lot of bronze statues. Um, it's not gold. Bronze is very low quality, but also most statues are bronze. So I'll give her that. But she had to, not just bronze. Um, we didn't, we couldn't infer that just from the color saying it's bronze because really most bronze statues end up looking like black. Um, it's spray tan. So we just really needed to make sure we knew she had a spray tan and that that was memorialized on her statue that is threatening to push her down the stairs at their school. So threatening to cause her damage in the industry that they kind of like both share basically. In like a petty senseless way, like pushing someone down the stairs is so like coming up behind someone and just being like, oop, like you, like not even starting a fight where they can do something back, just being like, nope, fuck you, nothing you can do about it. There's also something very interesting to the fact that the way this person is memorialized is being spray tanned and threatening to push Taylor Swift down the stairs at their school. Like even in their like statue commemorating who they were, they are spray tanned and they are threatening to kick Taylor Swift's ass. Like I, there's just something very like, and this is who you are to me. Um, and this is how you will be remembered um, in like that, that is very, very cold. And it was always the same. The things that she did were always the same and the pain was always the same searing pain. But I dreamed that one day I could say, um, very someday I'm gonna be living in a big old city. All that time that you were throwing punches and putting in all of this effort, I was building, I was building something. I was doing something productive. And I can't forgive the searing pain. I can't forgive the way that you made me feel because I screamed, fuck you, Amy, in the night as the blood was gushing out of me. And the lonely cold night as blood was gushing out of me, I cursed your name. But I can't forget the wound that that blood was gushing out of it had to heal and I learned how to heal so deeply. I learned to heal from a wound that deep because you made it. And that is a strength that I have now because it wasn't a fair fight or a clean kill. There was just, everything was done with the jagged edge of a knife, um, messy, sloppy, underhanded. Each time that Amy stomped across my grave, she was already dead, but she just felt the need to stomp vengefully with an attitude across her grave. And then on top of that, she wrote headlines because she just couldn't stop in the local paper laughing at each tiny baby step she would take to try and crawl out of her grave. She would just smack it down. And it was always the same searing pain. Um, she doesn't emphasize the localness of this all. It was all very much like in her hometown, um, if you will. It was personal because these were her peers, because this was the town in which she was trying to work. This, These were her people. These were the people that she needed to like her, and she was turning them all against her. And every time she tried to do something, she would go, nope. And I prayed, not even dreaming now, we're making it, we're asking this guy that one day she could say, all that time she was going through all the effort to stomp across her grave and write headlines. She was putting effort into building something. And everyone knows that her mother is a wonderful, saintly woman. But she used to say she wished that you were dead. That's such a bomb to drop. Like I... I have to feel, she would put that in there if Andrea didn't approve it. Like all I picture when I hear that line is her being like, mom, I'm gonna say this, is that okay? And she, and Andrea going, hell yeah, I'll say it again. I push each boulder up the hill. Your words just still ringing in my head, ringing in my head. So this is a long process, just really continuing a sustained effort, being motivated by her hatred and the thought of the blood gushing and being like, nope, fuck you. <laughs> this push is a fuck you. And like really motivating herself with that hatred, which, you know, whatever gets you there. I wrote a thousand songs that 
you find uncool, but I built a legacy with them that you can't do anything about no matter how uncool you find it. And when I count the scars and all of the things that you did um, that I still have marks on my body because of, there's a little moment that I realized I wouldn't have had the strength to get here if I hadn't learned to heal from all of these deep scars that you gave me. So there wouldn't be this if there hadn't been you. And you know what, maybe you don't think about it the same way and in your mind you never did any of this. You never took my literal spirit and beat it black and blue because I don't think you've really changed much from what I knew. And so since um, you haven't changed much and you don't think of it the same way and we're not gonna be in agreement. I've just changed your name and a real defining clues. Um, so no one's really gonna know this about you. And maybe even your kid will be singing it because I wrote all of these songs that you find uncool, but other people don't find them uncool because I built a legacy that you can't undo. And so maybe your kid will come home singing one of my songs as she so often does, as I know she so often does because she posts them on Instagram. Your kid comes home singing this song that only us two is gonna know about you. And how upsetting would that be? Yeah, I don't feel like that line is like bringing the kids into it anyway, because she's not saying anything about the kids. She's just saying, I know my songs are popular and I do have some ones about the things that you did um, to me and there is truth in those songs and your kids are going to hear them and you know what, they're good and maybe they'll come home singing them and you'll know, you'll know that it's about you and that's just so, that's just so spicy and spiteful, Taylor. And then we wrap it back up and we end it with, thank you, Amy. All that time you were throwing punches it was all for nothing. And our town, the town that I cared so much about what they thought, looks so small from way up here where I am above all of that bullshit, above you, essentially. And I screamed, thank you, Amy, for giving me this strength because now I see the night sky and the stars are stunning and I can appreciate it because I am up here where it is beautiful, blood is no longer gushing and I can't forget the way you taught me to heal from all of those wounds and you gave me the motivation to build all of this. So thank you. Thank you for that and good night. And that's thank you, Amy. So um, I'm addicted to this song. Um, and probably more so than any other song on the Tortured Poets Department anthology and standard edition. There's just, there's just, just little enough of this song that every time I listen to it, I'm like, I need another bite. I need more. Um, especially like the beginning oh, with the strings. I'm obsessed with the strings and the plucking on this song in the big, like, like swell that happens right before she starts singing. I, uh, there's this haunting, wandering coldness about it. I just... I love it. I love the mysteriousness in it um, and like the vagueness and the floating. Oh, it's just so perfect. I had died the tiniest death. The little piece of me died inside. I spied the catch in your breath. Out, 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 out. Oh, the way, and this is so well written like a poem, but the way she does like out, 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 south, 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 now, now, now downtown downtown it's just oh, it's so haunting and beautiful the way that she also just kind of like lingers on some of these words and phrases and allows them to kind of like repeat and fade out it feels like a memory like it feels like the persistence and the pervasive lingering of a memory of a person or a place connected to a person it's like as every time she says the word like drifts away you can feel the drifting away of the memory and the feeling and the person that she's craving so much that she is looking in people's windows realistically metaphorically what have you um so desperate for a taste of that in them something inside me died a little bit when I spied the catching your breath out. And so usually when someone's breath catches, it means that they're upset, trying not to show emotion, but like it's betraying them a little bit because their breath is catching. Northbound, I got carried away as you boarded your train south. This sounds like, I'm not sure if Hempstead Heath, where Taylor lived in London, um, is north and perhaps Maddie lived somewhere south. I'm not entirely sure, or this could just be metaphorical, um, like someone getting carried away one way and then someone getting on a train, taking them the other way. Like 
this is just two people being separated out of their control. And that's perfectly demonstrated by the next line, a feather taken by the wind blowing, just something being taken in a direction by something that is not within their own control. It's just kind of carrying them through um, in the direction that it's going to. But she's afflicted by the not knowing perhaps what would have happened if the wind had blown in a different direction. Since she is afflicted by not knowing, she is obsessed and she looks in people's windows. She lurks, transfixed by the rose golden glow on the inside. So she lurks from outside people's lives, perhaps on social media in different other ways. But here she's talking about literally walking around cold streets and looking in people's windows at the warm light inside and the friends that they're having over to drink nice wine, like the normal social happy interactions that they're having in case the person that she wishes the wind had blown her into, that things had ended up correctly with, is there. You know when you're desperate to see someone again, you're desperate for something to work out, you're just kind of hoping you, it's like Chapel Roan's song Subway, until I don't search for you on the subway anymore. Like you are kind of always in public looking for them and it's not even that you're not even sure what you're hoping for. You're just kind of like, I just really want to see them. Like you're like addicted to them and craving them. And you're like, maybe if we see each other and we collide in this way again, maybe something will work out and something will be different because I'm so seemingly irrevocably unhappy and like starving for resolution in this relationship somehow now. She is obsessed with like having that encounter and being like, ah, maybe we could connect again. Maybe what if something different had happened in case you're at their table? What if your eyes looked up and met mine one more time? This is probably in the interim, um, like when the one was written and stuff, but this is also so relatable after a breakup, like thinking maybe what you had was real and you could get it back and it could be good again and you could crash into each other again and things might work out differently. So now we go back into the past. You had stopped and tilted your head and I still ponder what it meant now. What were you thinking? What was going through your head? What happened? Could I have done something about it? Did it lead to where we are now? I tried searching faces on streets. I looked for you everywhere I went. I looked for you in a crowd. What are the chances you'd be downtown going somewhere and wondering if maybe they'll be there and kind of sort of hoping you'll run into them? Does it feel all right to not know me? Are you doing the same thing? Are you still wondering to, I'm addicted to the if only I knew, if only this, if only that, if only the wind had blown differently, if only I knew if you were wondering, if only I caught your eye from across a room and one of us decided to do something about it. So instead, I look in people's windows, I scroll through people's Instagrams and I lurk to see if you are at different parties that I'm not at. I attend Christmas parties from the outside to see if you were there and get insight onto your life and your goings on. I look in people's windows in case you're at their table. What if your eyes looked up and met mine one more time? Oh, I want more. I want, I, oh, it's so good. It's so good. And it's such a relatable thought and it's so haunting. And it could be looking in people's windows. You picture, you know, like someone walking around and like checking and being like, I just want to know if you're feeling the same way. And if we did meet eyes one more time, if you would be desperate to do something about it like I'm feeling if you are addicted to the if only to. It's just such, let me know if you have experienced this before, but it is such a familiar feeling, um, especially being somewhere that you know that they, maybe they pass through or that they are a lot and kind of like hoping you see them, but also kind of hoping not. Um, but like you can't help but be kind of elated by the thought of what might happen if you did, even though it's unrealistic. And being afflicted by that and like trying to push it away, but still aimlessly wandering around, wondering and kind of hoping in the back of your head. Like this weird toxic addiction is so well portrayed in this song and the echoiness of it and the cold evermore nature of it just, oh, it's just so, so wonderful. Um, and it comes together so beautifully. The tiny little sounds that you can hear from the strings in your earphones are just so addicting to me. This song is just as addicting as the if only. We have arrived at the final day of talking 
of our anthology lyrics. We have six more tracks to discuss, beginning with The Prophecy. So this song is, it's acoustic, but it's quick. Like it's so, so quick. It feels very immediate and urgent and like, like we gotta go right now. And so I suppose once you hear the song, what you're detecting is um, desperation um, and fear. Um, I don't know why I'm laughing when I'm saying that. Um, it's probably my own defense mechanisms. Hand on the throttle, we just, she keeps using this line. She loves the love is a car metaphor and she loves even more the full throttle etc metaphor as in ready to go or speeding forward speeding up etc she is ready to go thought i caught lightning in a bottle thought i did the impossible finally did it finally made it finally captured the magic that is a forever love oh but it's gone again just like a strike of lightning or the idea of capturing something like lightning in a bottle it is simply gone again poof and she can't even understand how it ended like she says in how did it end and it was written i got cursed like eve got bitten so and it was written. Written where? The idea of having something be written though makes it seem very um, historical. Something that is written will stand the test of time. Something that is written just in its most simplest form. You know, if it was written down, that's why the development of libraries and writing and alphabet. Writing is important because it passes ideas through time and so if something was written that gives it some sort of permanence. So if we keep going and we want to figure out what this idea of the word written is, we keep going and we see I got cursed like Eve got bitten. Basically a prophecy or curse is something that is written. It is foretold um, just like some things in the Bible. Um, then she goes into what's interesting is that she says I got cursed like Eve got bitten. Now I'm not sure if it was foretold that Eve was going to be bit because Eve wasn't actually bitten by the snake. Eve bit the apple because the snake convinced her to because she was bitten with the bug of desire for more, desire for knowledge. Um, and then she bit the apple and we'll talk about what happened in a second. But this idea of things being fate, of something being an invisible string, something being foretold, something being meant to be, she is very attached to this idea. She's been attached to it since she was younger and like not for nothing, it's something that's very much sold to us in songs, literature, um, movies, etc. And so like it's not something that I'm like not attached to. Like the idea of fate and there being an invisible string between two people and things working out the way they're supposed to and pieces falling into place. She's going back through that and like assessing, so if these, this is how things are now, what does that say about what is foretold? What does that say about what is fate if this is where I am right now? And so she then asks, oh, was it punishment? Now when Eve did bite the apple, she was punished by being thrown out forever. And so there's a little bit there of like, is this being taken away from me because I got something else, because I did something else and so I don't deserve this? It also makes me think of that line in Bigger Than the Whole Sky, did some greater force take you away because I didn't pray. The idea of like karma, <laughs> um, really things not working out because she didn't do something and things working out because she did deserve them and she did work for them. I feel like Taylor Swift chronicles really well the hope of that mindset and then the hurt of the breakdown of it when things don't happen that match up with it and the pain of well if that's not how things work then like <laughs> what kind of fucking world do we live in um and i am i'm having that breakdown every day i pad around when i get home like a restless caged animal in a house not a home all alone because nobody's there where she paces in her pen and her friends found friends who care i am forever a dear reader stan also the caged animal thing really does just keep coming up. We see it in Who's Afraid of Little Old Me um, the most, obviously, and she definitely highlighted that on tour. 
I guess a lesser woman would have lost hope. This is like kind of a very self-comforting line. Like, I guess I have been strong. I guess someone, you know, who is lesser than me would have given up before now, but someone who was stronger than me wouldn't be begging, wouldn't be throwing away her pride like I am and looking to the sky, asking the stars and the powers that be. Please, I've been on my knees praying and begging, change the prophecy. I don't want money, the thing that she finally does have a lot of and kind of has always had um, a decent amount of when you think about um, how much, how her career got started and how her parents definitely helped fund that. Just someone who wants my company let it once be me. Again, that's something she used to say about what she has now. So now that she has been picked like a rose to be the star that she is um, in her career that she's absolutely earned, she's saying, let it once be me to have that forever love because I still somehow don't have that. Who do I have to speak to? Who was it written by? about if they can redo the prophecy. Who is they? Whoever she's praying to, whoever it was written by the fates, about if they can redo the prophecy um, of her being the songstress of a generation, the person who chronicles heartbreak and love and life kind of through that lens um, will never actually find her forever love. What a terrible irony that the person who best breathes life into that experience and those feelings will never actually find her perfect one because of all of the things that have kind of been discussed and worked through on this album. Um, but again, I don't have time to go through um, why it's difficult for Taylor Swift to be in a relationship, but maybe check out the daddy I love him, who's afraid of little old me, among other things. Um, peace, maybe. What I love about this song, and what I know like a lot of people love about the song, is that this chorus is like her prayer. Like I can so picture her. I would love a music video for this song. I'm sure it's not gonna happen ever. Um, but because it's on the anthology, like it's not gonna be a single. Um, we just got I can do it with a broken heart, and I love that like the chorus is her on her knees begging and praying with this little poem. Cards on the table, mine play out like fools in a fable. This could be, so when I hear fools in a fable, I initially thought tarot cards, like they're like the fool, um, but she also mentions a fool in another song, LOML, a con man sells a fool, a get love, quick scheme. And there is in that same song, she says he shit talked her under the table. And what was interesting about that was that that's what you do to an opponent you're playing a game with. And she and many other people have talked about the game of love and it being kind of like, um, like chess or whatever game you want. Um, there have been many, many, many metaphors, um, even like in mastermind, Taylor Swift kind of refers to it, her mastermind the whole game and the whole thing but she's playing the game with her opponent and her cards are on the table which is another phrase for being honest and like being vulnerable but hers play out like fools in a fable it's like this is a myth for her to be failing and losing at the game even though her cards are on the table and she is being vulnerable and honest oh it was sinking in either the realization that some things aren't going well or the um, poison we're gonna hear about in a couple of lines is sinking in. Slow is the quicksand, slow is the death. Um, it kind of reminds me of the frog sitting in the pot of boiling water. If you know, you know, if you don't, don't look it up. Poison blood from the wound of the prick tan. So either his injury or her own injury was poisoned to her. So she was either poisoned by some injury she sustained or he was injured and she was trying to help him with that injury and his blood ended up being poison to her. And yet she dreams of him because either his blood poisoned her, he wounded her and that blood poisoned her. I think it was probably she was pricked by him in the past and it was poison to her blood and she couldn't get it out of her. Um, and even though that is like what happened and what she went through, she still dreams of him because she almost had all that she wanted. And so she looks to the sky and prays and begs, please, I've been on my knees. We have another chorus and I sound like an infant. She repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly is acknowledging how 
she feels and thinks that she sounds pathetic and juvenile. A lesser woman would have lost hope. A greater woman wouldn't beg. I look unstable. She's really like kind of like self-justifying this and being like, I understand this record makes me sound emotional and crazy. I know I look emotional and crazy um, because she's just so used to people calling her emotional and crazy. And so she's like kind of getting ahead of it um, with this, but also like probably self-judging herself a little bit. But also crying like a baby in the back of the car, I sound like an infant. Just like being upset and crying could be what she's referring to. Feeling like the very last drops of an ink pen barely there and spent out and like trying to like get like another letter, another word, like finish what you're writing out, but it's just not there. There's simply nothing left to give. A greater woman stays cool, but I howl at the moon like a wolf. Another like kind of like cage, wild, ravenous animal longing and crying in to the night at the sky. And I I look unstable, gathered with a coven around a sorcerer's table using any means, even witchcraft, because she will do anything that it takes at this point. And a greater woman has faith, which is seen to be like the opposite um, of like the occult and stuff. Even. But even statues crumble if they're made to wait. Even something beautiful and meant to last for a very, very, very long time crumbles if it is made to wait for long enough and that's how long she feels like she's been waiting. I'm so afraid that I sealed my fate. And it's interesting until now in this song, this has been like, please change the prophecy. It was written, I got cursed. I'm howling at the moon. I'm begging on my knees. This has all been out of her control until this first line, I'm so afraid I sealed my fate. She's saying she thinks something she did caused this to be her final fate and like put a stamp in it. She's afraid she made a grave error somewhere. I'm just a paperweight, something heavy and pretty, but ultimately useless. In shades of grayish, the boringest of colors, spending my last coin so someone will tell me it'll be okay. Feeling pathetic and spending the money that she has that she doesn't want, spending the very last bit of it, squandering it all just to hear from someone that it will be okay because she doesn't have a forever person there to tell her. And then it ends with another chorus and this just screaming, like, uh, it's not screaming, it's like this soft, please. Like, it's just, uh, it's the perfect, just like, plea summing up all of the feeling and just like putting a period on it with one last cry. We end back at the beginning because this is a cycle. She's constantly asking, constantly saying, please, I've been on my knees. Don't want money. Just someone who wants my company. What did I do? How did we get here? I sound so stupid, but oh my God, please. Sorry. I like had to like sit back. So I moved the camera a little bit. I am so addicted to the melody of this song, the little like So it's so haunting and it makes the entire song worth it to me, um, even though it is like just a little bit repetitive, but Taylor clearly likes it. I like it a lot. Um, and it got a voice memo. I was very surprised at the songs that got voice memos, but this is one of them. I was in my new house placing daydreams. So somewhere new, putting things up, making them her own and patching up a crack along the wall. Pass it and lose track of what I'm saying because that's where I was when I got the call. Patching up this crack along the wall because when she passes it, she forgets what she's doing because her mind goes straight back to this memory and this thought of something that happened there because that's where she was when she got this call and something happened. And so she's patching it up because every single time she passes it, her mind just completely reverts to going back to that. And so she's patching it up. And when the first stone's thrown, they're screaming. In the streets, there's a raging riot. When it's burned, the bitch, they're shrieking. They're burning all the witches, even if you aren't one, so light me up. When everyone is getting all riled up and piling on and the jackals are raising their hackles and deciding that the mob is descending on someone because something or someone has been wronged, people feel so incredibly strongly. People only feel bad after they have had time away from the mob to think, and no one will admit that they may have been wrong afterwards, because that would be embarrassing. 
for everyone. It would be basically like bringing up the fact that all of these other people were wrong too, and then you risk that mob turning against you. And so it's just easier to let the one person that um, was actually wronged and you were wrong about suffer. And so they killed Cassandra first. So the whole thing about Cassandra, she was gifted, she was I believe like a Roman, um, a Greek or a Roman, and she was gifted with sight. She could see what was going to happen and predict things, but she was cursed to never be believed. Um, the things that she said were so horrific, kind of like Bruno, um, low key, it's giving Bruno from Encanto. To never be believed, the things that she said were so grave, no one ever believed her, but then they came true. And so she was killed um, for predicting, you know, the bad things, just how nobody liked Bruno because he always predicted how bad things were gonna happen. So they killed her first because she feared the worst and she tried to tell the town, but they didn't like the sound of that. And they were like, nope, you're not saying that's going to happen. That's absolutely awful. That can't possibly be true. That would mean that we were all wrong about these people who we thought were good. And so they filled my cell with snakes. So suddenly we're not talking about Cassandra. So snake gay, everyone flooding her comments with snakes at the behest of one Amy, I regret to say, do you believe me now? You killed me, you burned this witch, and luckily I rose back up from the grave. But do you believe me now? What if I hadn't? Yikes, there's still just, there's still just, uh, there's a lot of bitterness there, and that's, that's okay. Um, if it wasn't clear, this is, again, about the Kim Ye situation and kind of drawing a parallel there. Um, it's not just about that. It's a little bit about more, like, the concept with Cassandra and things, um, but that's definitely tied in there because, of course it is, um, and I'm here for it. I feel like I keep seeing people say they're sick of hearing about this dynamic and this relationship and this situation, but here's the thing. When something affected you and was significant, in your life, it doesn't stop being that, especially when you are kind of forced to be aware of the people that it happened with and the public is constantly registering opinions on them and like you are in the same sphere um you are in like the same hometown like she said and thank you amy like i just don't think that it's weird or crazy or obsessive to continue to have thoughts and see new facets of and just create new art based on something that was a very big deal in your life because you continue to think about it and you continue to have new perspectives on it because it continues to have been something that was a big deal I don't know I feel like I'm thinking of things that fall into that category for me and they certainly weren't as intense as what Taylor Swift went through in the situation that she's referring to not to mention any other situations that Taylor Swift has gone through so I don't know that's just that's my perspective on why I'm like yeah be bitter we are all a, a little bitter about a thing or two you know and I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with that and I don't think um she should be shamed for expressing that um even if it's about the same thing like I don't know god forbid you're just not perfect and like processing and throwing away all of your emotions like Taylor Swift may forgive, but she doesn't forget. And like, honestly, it's not her obligation to forgive either. She has a quote about that that I absolutely love. I'm gonna stop ranting about this now. I was in my tower weaving nightmares, um, a tower somewhere where a princess or um, an evil sorceress is locked away, twisting all my smiles into snarls. They say what doesn't kill you makes you aware. What happens if it becomes who you are? So she's weaving nightmares, twisting all her smiles into snarls and having this thing that didn't absolutely kill her absolutely overtake her mentally. She's driving herself mad thinking about this thing and it is absolutely taking over her mind. She's pacing in her pen, weaving nightmares and going crazy. So they set my life in flames. I regret to say, do you believe me now? There's kind of this implication that she is dead. She's not anymore. She was killed and she did rise, which is good. Um, she rose high enough to say, thank you, Amy. And that we are great, grateful for. They knew what they knew. They knew the whole time that I was on to something. The family, the pure greed, the Christian chorus line. They all said nothing. 
So the entire family said nothing. I don't know, these are some accusations. The pure greed that was clearly present. I think this is some slander against a whole family. <laughs> Blood's thick, but nothing like a payroll. This is implying that they will betray each other for money one day. I know people are reading this and saying like, well, they haven't necessarily done that, but like, I'm not sure that they haven't and we just don't know. And also, I feel like this isn't so much a statement as a prediction. I feel like people are taking it as a statement. I feel like it's a prediction. Blood's thick, but nothing like a payroll. You will eventually turn on each other. And I bet they never spared a prayer for my soul. You pray for everyone and you wish light and love on everyone until they're the person you decide to burn down. So it's not everyone. You can mark my words that I said it first. I called them on being snakes first in a sad, grieving, mourning, warning, mourning all that she lost in this burning fire, warning to everyone else that no one heard because it was completely ignored because she was a pariah at the time. I patched up the crack along the wall. She still passes it and lose track of what she's saying because that's where she was when she lost it all on the call. Or maybe there because every time she passed it, she lost track of what she was saying and started ruminating. And so she lost it all next to that crack because she just couldn't take it anymore. Um, either way, she patched it up and she still loses track of what she's saying when she passes it. And we have another chorus, another, another second chorus. And we end with, it's so quiet, just a haunting reminder of the silence where responsibility should be um when that mob realizes that they were all wrong i love this song the song is so unique and fun and i just i very much enjoy it by all accounts she almost drowned when she was six in frigid water so just from like the language and it continues throughout the whole song until it kind of doesn't, the language does, but there's like a couple fourth wall breaking moments. It's a report on someone from a third party, the entire song. And there's certain language choices that are made that make it sound very old fashioned. And it's because those word choices are formal and it makes it sound like the person who's telling the story is a very polite adult. By all accounts, she almost drowned when she was six in frigid water. Just using the word frigid, not like icy, it's just they're a little bit old, old-fashioned aged terms, but they're all very polite and a little bit cute um, to our eye now because of like how old they are. And Taylor's really good at like picking language like that to build a vibe. She does it um, a lot on folklore most readily and on a lot of other songs. It's kind of how she builds a vibe and a story with language. It's like very, 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 very clear here though, because people all say like, this song sounds old, but I'm not sure why. It's that, it's the language combined with the fact that it is acoustic. So it doesn't give like a newer flavor to it. But um, I'm gonna try and point out every time there's like a word or phrase that contributes to that. But even just the like, reporting um, beginning of this, people don't say, well, by all accounts anymore, um, but like they did. <laughs> well, by all accounts, she almost drowned when she was six in frigid water. And I can confirm, again, like a report, she made a curious child, curious, ever reviled, um, I'm not sure people ever really said that word, but um, disliked by everyone except her own father. So her dad was the only man who ever loved her with a quite bewitching face, not pretty, but kind of like striking, bewitching, um, which is interesting after our little witch song that we just had. Splendidly selfish, splendidly, charmingly helpless. This sounds like how you are when you're like flirting with someone. You're just like charmingly um, letting them do things for you, charmingly helpless, charm a little bit letting them pay for things selfish excellent fun till you really get to know her till you get deep then she runs like it's a race she gets right out of there and behind her back her best mates um kind of a british term but also just not one that we use really today excellent fun and she runs like it's a race i'm not sure if those are all british terms i feel like i've heard excellent fun and best mates in um british language before i'm not sure if she runs like it's a races though or if that's just 
Taylor and they nicknamed her the Bolter. Um, I doubt like kids were nicknaming their friends this, but it definitely was something that was used to kind of shame women for not staying in long-term relationships. Started with a kiss, um, as so many things do. Um, that's such like a classic, like started with a kiss and then um, very cute. Oh, we must stop meeting like this. That sounds again, just very like old fashioned informal, almost like Bridgerton-y. It starts with a meet cute but it always ends up with a town car, um, someone with a driver speeding out the drive one evening. It ends with a swift exit in the slam of a door and him calling her a whore. So anger and hatred from both sides and she wishes he wouldn't be hateful and sore, but as she was leaving, it did feel like breathing. Each time she leaves, it feels like a breath of fresh air in all her fucking lives. Now kind of the formal language changes, which makes it feels like which makes it feel like a fourth wall break and also her doing that here in this moment that vulnerability of dropping the formal language and saying all her fucking lives flash before her eyes when she was leaving and it felt like breathing gives this moment more realness and more vulnerability it illustrates the importance and the vulnerability of this moment within the story of the song the idea that when she is leaving she feels like she's coming back in to herself and like taking a fresh breath again. And she realizes that it feels like the time she fell through the ice and then came out alive. So when she leaves, it feels like breathing and all of the times she did before flash before her eyes and every time it's felt like a breath of fresh air and she's sad, but it feels like breathing like shock and numbness and pain and literal death. But then when you come out alive, it somehow feels like rising again and being barely alive, but also being born again. And maybe that's a little bit addicting and maybe that's a little bit of a cycle is what she's saying here. And maybe that's how she sealed her fate question mark. He was a cad, another kind of like old fashioned language, wanted her bad just like any good trophy hunter, um, someone who hunts for sport um, to get the biggest, nicest animals to put on their wall. So someone who is looking um, for like the prettiest prize of a girl basically. And she liked the way it tastes. She enjoyed the honeymoon phase of taming the bear, taming the beast of the trophy hunter to be gentle and making him care, watching him jump and want something and then pulling him under playing the game and at first blush um again cute and old-fashioned this is fate it seems like this is the prophecy she caught lightning in the bottle when it is all roses and portrait poses central park lake and tiny rowboats very nice summery spring imagery what a charming saturday we have charming again this is a very charming song that's when she sees the littlest leaks things she have to look close to see but seeing tiny little cracks down in the floorboards of the boat that is their relationship and she just knows she gets this premature feeling that she's got to get out she's got to hurl herself off the edge of the boat and leave before she gets left before she gets hurt. She's been many places with men of many faces, seeing it all, and first they're off to the races, hand on the throttle, and she's laughing, drawing aces, her cards are on the table, and they're playing out well. She's drawing aces, but none of it is changing. The prophecy won't change. The chariot, the getaway car, is waiting. Hearts are hers for the breaking. There is freedom to be had. And then she whispers, there's escape in escaping. She is a little bit addicted to the getaway car, question mark. Is that how she sealed her fate? Is that what she's saying? I don't know, um, but that's a little bit what it sounds like. And I love um, the little fourth wall breaks of this song, like the little whisper and the intricacy of the language. And because it's not, it's just enough to be effective, but it's not so much that you can't understand it. It's not so flowery and over the top that it's hard to follow. It's just enough to have the perfect effect. And that is why I, I am a Bolter fan. Um, we're not ranking these songs until like the next video, but I feel like it's becoming very clear which ones I like. So this, ta this song I liked at first, but definitely took some simmering for everything to kind of click in. But there's so much juice in Peter. This song is 
how Peter lost Wendy um, from Cardigan. Forgive me, Peter, my lost fearless leader, um, the leader of the Lost Boys and Wendy. So Taylor's Wendy in this context because from Cardigan, Peter losing Wendy, that was the song that she mouthed. This song's about you. You know who you are. I love you. Um, and Maddie did that right before that. It was a whole thing. He is the grown-up emo Peter Pan um, and she is Wendy. Peter losing Wendy is a lyric in Cardigan. That's kind of the shortened version of the lore and now the song is called Peter. And not only that but there's so much more to it. In Peter Pan, Wendy and John and Michael went to Neverland to be with Peter and the Lost Boys. There are different iterations and the end of Peter Pan she chooses not to stay in Neverland and he has to go back to Neverland and she ends up growing up and he comes back and is like, Wendy you're all growing up and she's like, I had to grow up, Peter. Forgive me, Peter, my lost fearless leader in closets like cedar preserved when we were just kids. The memory of you is tucked and preserved in the back of my closet like Narnia in the back of a wardrobe. Did this happen because of something that I did? Did I cause this? She's always asking that. She's always like, is this my fault? Always forever taking accountability. The goddess of timing once found us beguiling. Timing didn't work out, but you said that you would try. She said she was trying, Peter, was she lying? And now I find it interesting. She could have said, the goddess of timing once found us beguiling. You said you were trying, Peter, were you lying? My ribs get the feeling you did. I, I, why, why does it have to be she? Why can't she, she really doesn't place hardly any blame on him in this entire song. She's incredibly gentle and sad and sorry the whole time. She really doesn't place responsibility on him like she does in Chloe or Sam or Sophia or Marcus. Um, she says the goddess of timing, she kind of puts it on fate. The goddess of timing once found us beguiling. She says she was trying, Peter, was she lying? My ribs get the feeling she did. My ribs, ugh, my bones, my heart, my soul, all of my guts, everything in me gets the feeling that whatever was trying to make it work out for us didn't actually try hard enough and I did not want to leave Neverland with you. I thought it was just goodbye for now because you said that eventually you were gonna grow up and then you were gonna come find me and the implication is, and then we would be together again. You said you were gonna grow up and you were gonna come find me. And she says it over and over and over again. And it's like, this is the ruminating, the being stuck on someone's promise and how they could have meant it. And this could be the reality or how they could possibly have not meant it, but still be the person you thought they were and still have everything be true of the memories and everything you had together. It's also, when I, first heard this song all I could picture was people dancing and I started kind of like going like that and then I realized it's because this is a waltz. Who's going to keep us from waltzing back into rekindled flames if we know the steps anyway? And to me that makes it so much easier to like enjoy the repetition of this song when you just, I don't know, I just picture the dancing phantoms of them on the terrace waltzing around to the memory of said you were gonna come, grow up then you were gonna come find me said you were gonna grow up then you were gonna come find me and her just picturing them dancing around to them from the bed that she can't get out of staring at the window that she used to stare up at the stars oh god i'm getting i'm getting words from the mouth of babes things that are shockingly wise from a young soul it was what that kind of um idiom means words from the mouth of babes is from the bible but basically like the meaning that's been pulled out of it um, over the years and stuff is wise information from the mouth of someone, from someone young, from a surprising source. Promises, oceans deep, so never ending, but never to keep, never fulfilled, never to keep. Ugh, and repeated twice because it hurt that bad and it's that sad. Are you still a mind reader? Or are you still a natural scene stealer? I've heard great things, Peter, but life was always easier on you. Are you still the amazing, charismatic person I remember? I heard that you are doing great and that you are having an easier time than I am because um, the world has just kind of been nicer to you than it has been to me. It's given you a pass for a lot of things that it wouldn't have given me a pass for, um, which is actually very true about Maddie. <laughs> and sometimes it gets me when crossing your jet stream. We both did the best we could do. As we see each other in each other's orbits, I think about how we did the best we could 
but I simply couldn't stay. Also something that has a jet stream is like flying around and powerful and like supersonic. We did the best we could do underneath the same moon in different galaxies. So similar souls living entirely different lives in entirely different places and circumstances. And I didn't want to hang around. Killing time at the graveyard. It's giving killing time at the graveyard. Like hanging around is being somewhere when it's not purposeful or needed and you being there is maybe unnecessary or ignored and she didn't want to linger for nothing but they did promise that it would just be goodbye for now because they said he was gonna grow up and then he was gonna come find her and I won't confess that I waited so she didn't stand and wait and not give her attention to absolutely anyone else, but she did let the lamp burn. She let the candle burn in her heart as the men masqueraded and hid and dressed up and went out and presented themselves to her. I hoped inside you would return, that you'd get it together and come back like you said, with your feet on the ground, with your life scraped together, and you'd tell me all that you'd learned because love's never lost when perspective is earned. You'd tell me how you'd grown and I would do the same. We were just kids, babe. I don't mind, it takes time. And you said you'd come and get me but eventually you were 25 and the shelf life of the Neverland fantasies had expired. The idea of a shelf life and something expiring is very earthly and very finite and the idea of a fantasy and Peter Pan and Neverland and eternal youth is very forever and that was no longer who he was anymore. Those were rotten, um, they had lost their sparkle, They had a shelf life now and they had expired. The Lost Boys chapter of his life, um, the storybook chapter was ripped out. It was no longer there, it had been lost. And she's begging for forgiveness, for giving up as well. That's so sad and that shows such real love. And I know the things that I felt that way about. I used to be very much like that. And I think I still am inside. I think I've just kind of like built up walls, I guess, but just feeling awful about letting go of things because you feel such love and responsibility to them. Forgive me, Peter. Please know that I tried to hold on to the days when you were mine. Forgive me for letting go. But by the time you grew up, you'd forgotten to care about the promises that you made. And the woman who, who sits by the window looking up at the sky at Neverland at the second star to the right, starry-eyed, which is what she was always talking about being with Maddie, looking up at the sky at the second star to the right at Neverland. That's why they were starry-eyed. Wendy, looking up, has turned out the light, turned out her bedroom light and gone to bed, gone to sleep and moved on. Another word you could call a fantasy is a legend, as in it was legendary. Um, but there are, already, there are already enough parallels, I'm not gonna push it too far. She has turned out the lamp that she let burn. Um, I love this song. It's so sad, but it also is such a nice kind of like, I don't know, it almost is like a lullaby too. Um, I just think it is so, so, so pretty. So Robin, um, contrary to what some may have thought, is not about Robin Williams, um, but Aaron Dessner's child, Robin, and about the innocence of childhood and how the way I kind of think about it is how like you give little kids like little kid answers to things not because you want to lie to them but because you want to preserve the view of the world that they have and the magic of that and like the wild freedom and like growth and just themselvesness that they're experiencing and it may be ignorance but it's a special type of ignorance and you preserve that for your children because of love out of sweetness um, because they deserve it because they are sweet and you want to give them the chance to climb higher and be light and fly and really spread their wings before they do experience the world coming down on them. It's essentially it. <laughs> um, it's not a very long 
song long may you reign long live your reign across your kingdom whatever that may be you are an animal blood thirsty powerful wild and free out window panes talking utter nonsense looking out the window muttering to yourself you have no idea what you look like you are in your own world and you have no idea about anything else it is so wonderful there are things made like strings tied to levers and impossible things done clocks slowed down tethered impossible tasks done just to keep your world amazing all the showmanship to keep it for you out of love in sweetness way to go tiger um so like that like you're a powerful animal you're bloodthirsty thing but also like way to go tiger like um what you say to like a kid at a soccer game higher and higher wilder and lighter because we are keeping this for you in sweetness now that is a very privileged privileged thing not every kid has that but if you are a parent i get how you could relate to really wanting that and just like your heart bursting with like wanting to give that to your kid making the world wilder and lighter for them and saying long may you roar at your dinosaurs in your imaginative play world may you be loud may you be in charge may you yell and roar at the things that are big and that scare you you are a ruler someone serious but you are also covered in mud you are unserious you can be both everything is so incredibly serious and and also play to you to kids they can look ridiculous and have no idea they can be unbothered by being covered in mud <laughs> very deep down and out of your reach is the secret we all vowed to keep from you the reality of the world and we're doing it in sweetness for you and saying way to go tiger so that you can climb higher and higher be wilder and fly lighter. You have the dragonflies above your bed and your favorite spot on the swing set. The things that inspire you to fly, the simple things that are everything to you that make you happy. And you have no room in your dreams for regrets yet because you haven't been here long enough to develop them. You have no idea how much is coming and the time will arrive for the cruel and the mean and one day you'll experience it and you'll learn to bounce back just like your trampoline. You're learning the little the little things now that will help you later. You just don't know it yet, but you will heal. But for now, we'll curtail your curiosity. We'll give you the little kid answers in sweetness to protect your heart. And it ends with the little chorus, and for you. Um, and it's cute that it's it ends with for you because um, it is for Aaron and Robin. Now and then she rereads the manuscript. So this is of all of the um, songs, this is the one that's the most like the poem because it doesn't really repeat. Some of the melody repeats, but none of the words do. Now and then she rereads the manuscript. So the documented on paper story of the entire torrid affair. And here's what happened. They compared their licenses and he said, I'm not a donor, but I'd give you my heart if you needed it. Now being a donor or not is on American licenses, but typically you would compare that to get information about each other, each other's name, and also your age. And usually you'd look at someone's license to see if they were 21 or not, which was right around when Taylor was dating a certain Jake Gyllenhaal about whom she wrote a lot of songs on Red, which was her other really big, massive heartbreak before this one. But that becomes a little bit more clear in this song, but that's just kind of something a lot of people have grabbed onto. Another thing that I haven't really heard people talk about in terms of the, hi, are you listening? Comparing their licenses thing is comparing their licenses in terms of like, just comparing their status, comparing where he was and where she was and for him to say i'm not a donor but i'd give you my heart if you needed it like i get that like it's like an organ donor thing and like that's on their licenses but i also find it interesting like comparing their statuses because of how she talks in 
all too well 10 and I bet you think about me about his superiority complex I could see them comparing him being a little bit higher status than her and just a little bit more sophisticated than her and he's like oh well I could I could donate some of that status and class to you um if you needed it that's how much I care for you I'm willing to help you um by giving you some I don't know just that kind of like looking down I don't know it's just kind of a note that keeps coming up for me when I hear those lyrics he said, I'm not a donor, but I'd give you my heart if you needed it. Now, like I said, the um, whether you're a donor or not is on American driver's licenses, but the idea of like, well, I'm not a donor, but I'd give you my heart if you needed it is such a like pickup line. And so in response, she rolls her eyes and says, oh, so you're a professional, like you're you're good at this. And also like you're older than me, like you've got it together. Um, and he said, no. Just a good guy, um, which is like, ugh, such a like smooth piece of shit Jalen Hall thing to say. And he said that if the sex was half as good as the conversation, soon they'd be pushing strollers. Um, they were connecting, but soon it was over. And in the age of him, she had wished she was 30, much older than she was. And she made coffee in a French press every morning, um, did the mature hip straight things and tried to fit in with his friends. And afterwards she only ate kids cereal, which is like a regression back to like not trying to be impressive, but it's also a depression food and couldn't sleep unless it was in her mother's bed. So she was traumatized. And then after that, she decided to try dating boys who were her own age, with dartboards on the back of their doors. It's giving early 20s, um, college, love to know that that is also the options that Taylor Swift had. And she thought about how he had said, since she was wise beyond her years, even though when they compared their licenses, he was so much older, everything had been above board. And now that she thought back on it, she wasn't sure and that's not a good feeling in the years past like the scenes of a show like eras and the professor whoever um someone advising her on her writing said to write what you know looking backwards may be the only way to move forward that is how you should write I know write what you know is I believe a Mark Twain quote, um, but the idea of looking back might be the only way to move forward. Like looking back and learning from the past and seeing the mistakes that have been made and seeing what has worked um, and going through those emotions might be the only way to really productively move forward. And then the actors were hitting their marks and the slow dance was alight with the sparks and the tears fell in synchronicity with the score. So people have surmised that this is about filming the All Too Well music video, which makes sense to me because that was a song that she had previously said was too painful for her to play. She did not like playing it, but because the fans had attached to it so much and loved it so much, it had changed meaning for her to the point where she really didn't feel that way about playing it anymore. And so when actors were hitting their marks and the slow dance was actually being lit by spark effects and tears fell in synchronicity with the song, at last she realized all of the agony had been for this, to share that feeling with, and her art with the world and make everyone who listens to her songs feel less alone in their agony. The only thing that's left of it all is the manuscript. One last thing that she carries from her trip to this person's shores and now and then she rereads it, but the story isn't necessarily hers anymore. She's released it. It's everyone's. And she's talked about that multiple times about how when she puts out music, she feels like it's not hers anymore. It is for people to listen to and apply to their own lives and their own heartbreaks and their own feelings. And so this is about her looking back on something that was so deeply her, that so deeply hurt and moving through that and looking back on it and seeing that she went through all of that pain and she created from it. And the way that she was able to rise up from that pain was through creating and sharing that and the success and the love that she's found in 
her career and her art has been what made all of that pain worth it. I don't feel like I hit this point hard enough. Like people loved All Too Well so much because it frames the feeling of feeling bereft after a relationship and remembering the moments of magic and remembering how they hit your heart and became part of you and sitting there and looking back and wondering if that person feels bruised and touched in the same way and how you could possibly be where you are now and just like going through the pain of that in the aftermath of the breakdown of a relationship like people connected with that so deeply they loved that song so much that they wanted to hear it live so bad but it hurt for her so much personally to go through it that she didn't like performing it she didn't like singing it because it was painful to go through that the amount of of and support that Swifties and like just listeners of that song felt just through being able to cry to it but not only that connect with each other over crying to it is monumental and incredible and from all of her suffering came that and a piece of healing for all of the other people going through that same type of suffering. And then I talk a little bit more about like the Taylor's version projects and the suffering of having her work stolen from her and what came out of that. But I don't know, I don't feel like I hit the point of all too well and like what her work um, and like her pain being turned into her work did um, for so many people. And all of the agony of writing that album and putting it out and having it not win was all for this red Taylor's version, for the Taylor's version. All of the agony of having her work taken away from her was all for the amazing rebirth and the amazing project that has been the Taylor's versions and the all too well 10 minute music video and all the things that we as the fans have been so lucky to get and have absolutely loved so very much. Um, so the manuscript is kind of a like nice summary poem um, for the life and times of Taylor Swiftum right now, um, among other things on Tortured Poets Department. As odd of kind of an album as it is and as different as it is, I really do appreciate it for what it is because I feel like it very much marks very clearly where Taylor Swift was at this point in her life in a way that to be honest, I don't think Midnight's did. I think that there were kernels of vulnerability in Midnight's, but I don't think that it was nearly as raw as Tortured Poets is. And so I feel like the manuscript is a perfect period on the end, just kind of like Dear Reader, but even more so um, reminding us all that, you know, the catharsis of putting out all of this work and going through it, please don't think that she still feels like she's dying at the hands of the smallest man who ever lived because she may have, but writing that song and doing this work and going through it is what created this album and is what is creating all of the joy that that set on the tour is making and everything that has come out of this album thus far. So it really kind of is this cyclical process, but then it also ends up being a trouble when you get into the prophecy. So yeah, the Taylor Swift of it all. Um, it's kind of a very interesting paradox that, um, really only applies to her in certain ways so yeah that's why i love being swifties so thank you guys so so very much for being here um and making it if you made it to the end of this mammoth freaking video um leave some black and white hearts below um especially like the black one because that is the color of the anthology i absolutely have loved going through these songs for you guys let me know if you'd like me to do analyses of other taylor swift songs i have tons of videos um planned for this channel that all kind of have to do 
revolving around Swiftyism and the pop girlies and such, um, but let me know if that's something you'd be interested in or if there are other Swifty videos that you'd be interested in seeing. Obviously the next one we will be ranking these babies, these songs, and slotting them into our ranking of the standard edition of Tortured Poets Department so you'll have them all ranked and pretty there. So I'm really looking forward to doing that and thank you guys so much again for being here. If you did like this video feel free to give it a like, especially if you made it this far. Um, you like something about hearing me talk so please feel free to like it it lets me know and it makes my heart so so very happy and helps me out on my little journey here on this platform a ton if you'd like to see more constant content from me i do post every single freaking day over on tiktok a lot of it is swifty content so feel free to go follow me there and subscribe if you would like to see more weekly content from me here thank you guys so much again for being here and i will see you so soon in the next one Mwah.